Good evening, space flight enthusiasts, and welcome to the first of our series of videos on the IAC conference and all of the amazing footage that I got along with all of the exclusive interviews that I gathered during this incredible experience that isn't quite over at the time that I'm recording this, but I want to go ahead and get you all of the spectacular details as rapidly as possible, including things like this incredible Lego sculpture of SLS, which by the way was accompanied by an incredible Lego sculpture of the solar system, which by the way included Pluto. So to give you a quick overview, there were a wide variety of major spaceflight companies included as sponsors and dealers on the floor, and I had an opportunity to talk to a great number of them, including in regard to their latest developments, latest technologies, and latest plans for success in the increasingly competitive spaceflight arena. So without further ado, let's go ahead and bring you the first of our interviews from the IAC conference and talk about rockets, robots, and space stations. All right, folks, the interviews continue ongoing here at IAC. However, now we have an opportunity to talk to my friends at PLD Space. Been looking forward to this. Please introduce yourself to the viewers. Hello, um, viewers. My name is Pablo Gallego, working for PLD Space. and Very happy to, to show you what we are doing. So catch us up on where you are now, just to, for a quick review, for because I've added quite a few subscribers since the last time we talked. Tell us real quick about who PLD Space is and what your goals are. So PLD Space is a launch service provided uh, located in, in Europe, uh, actually in Spain. And uh, we are focusing a small satellite, uh, launching a company called PLD Space, and the rocket is called Miura. We successfully launched Miura 1 as a demonstrator for what is the ultimate goal, which is Miura 5. Uh, and uh, Miura 5 is ready for launch uh, beginning of next year. Uh, I will have the capacity of 550 kilos in SSO and one ton in Equatorial launching from French Guiana. And then we will go further in um, bigger rockets uh, that I can explain later if you want. Sure. And as you can see, the flies here in Australia are just attacking us right now. It seems to be a, a seasonal thing in this country. Tell us a little bit about why you folks are here in Australia. What kind of opportunities are you looking for here? So Australia, as you know, is very strategic for us. It's a, in, um, it's a country, to be honest, that we are exploring. Uh, we know, especially because there are many opportunities, even for launching here. There are few spaceports that are available in the area, and also many customers that are really willing to to try new things, especially in the new space. There is a high need of satellites also in the area because of the big um, surface of the area of the country. And, um, and we, we can confirm eh, that we have many new inquiries from customers to launch um, their satellite with us and also opportunities even to launch from here. So very important to be here because of the location in Australia, but especially for the whole community that is joined in IAIF and uh, that is also asking for new launchers. Fantastic. Tell me about Mura 5, this new rocket you have. You're looking to launch it here soon. What makes it different? What are its capabilities? Well, uh, Mura 5, uh, you know, as you know, we launched Mura 1. Uh, Mura 1 successfully. That's something historic in Europe. It was the first uh, commercial company uh, developing a rocket, uh, launching successfully from Europe. Uh, so that was the demonstrator of what um, we are offering now, which is Mura 5. Mura 5 is an orbital rocket that can hold uh, 550 kilos in SSO and one ton in Equatorial. We are launching from French Guiana. I think this is a very good spot, especially to start uh, in a new company. 
So we are right now uh, in the process to um, finalize the qualification of the launcher and also the integration of the launch facilities in French Guiana. Now, last question in regards to, you are one of the few European companies that started aggressively talking about bigger rockets and human spaceflight. Now, all the other ones are trying to catch up. ESA had the a competition for bigger launchers. First of all, why were you looking at that so early and what are your plans there? I think it's uh, part of a PLD spirit. No? We start uh, Lidl uh, with Miura One. We are one demonstrator. You have to be humble to go big. We go step by step. Uh, we do not stop. Uh, Miura One uh, was a demonstrator for Miura Five, which is a launcher that will be commercial next year. So next step, we have to be growing with the market. The market is telling us you need to launch uh, bigger satellite, and especially you need to launch constellation, and you need to launch on time and e with a big cadence. So. We think um, a combination of, um, you know, the learning curve of uh, the different MIRAs and the market is telling us go for bigger, keep the, all the options open. That's the reason we are totally vertically integrated. We need to react with what market is telling us. Market is telling us be fast. I think we are pushing the whole Europe. I think we are the original one in Europe. I, at the time we create the company, we were the only one, even they were telling that we were crazy, you know, trying to build a private company in Europe when nobody was believing. At that time I worked as SpaceX and they'd say, well, it's impossible, reusability, all that. I think all together, I mean, SpaceX and even us uh, pushed for that a um, long time ago. I think Europe uh, now see that, uh, congratulations. We, we think we are helping, uh, not... Um, just destroying. We are helping Europe to to make things, you know, in a different way and to be competitive. And that's uh, simple. Market is telling to go there. We are not afraid of uh, even launching, uh, you know, humans to the space. Mm -hmm. But we have to demonstrate. Uh, don't be afraid and uh, just do it. And Europe, I think, is learning that uh, through us a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I hope um, we push the rest. Eh? Well, I'm looking forward to seeing what happens next. And just to let you know, at a time when things are so competitive, when so many companies are struggling, you guys are up to 400 employees now and still growing. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. Really appreciate your time. And vamos, Miura. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> uh, g'day, so my name is Michael Keller, I'm uh, working with Crest Robotics, uh, the developer of this, this robot here, Charlotte, uh, which is a hexapod designed for lunar construction um, and also terrestrial construction here on Earth, um, supported by the New South Wales State Government, um, part of their Space Plus program to uh, find terrestrial applications for space technologies um, for developing companies. Um, so the whole idea behind this robot is that um, it's used for a construction technique called earth bagging, um, which basically extrudes these um, these mesh bags. It's a bit like how sa sausages are made, except right. with dirt. Right? Okay. Um, and it extrudes these um, these ba mesh bags filled with dirt, and then it compacts them into layers. So um, you can build up these layers with multiple passes and so huh. you actually start building walls um, and um, berms and flood levees, that kind of thing on Earth as well. Um, but the view is that on the moon we could build radiation shelters for um, robotic systems that are up there. Right. Of course built um, dust mitigation structures, landing sites, that kind of thing. This is just the, our, our downscale prototype. Right. right? So you're looking at something bigger. Yeah, yeah. So if, if we want to build bigger structures, right, um, we want to be able to uh, straddle the walls. Right. And be able to, um, you know, if we want to build residential housing, sure. we need to build three, four meters tall. So, so how big do you think? Much bigger, bigger? Twice? Three times? Yeah, two, three times. Yeah. There would need to be a substantial amount of work done to make it space rated. Sure. Right? Uh, considering outgassing, radiation hardening. Right. 
a lot of work that needs to go into that. Sure. Um, so I, I can't really say exactly how much it would, right. it would weigh. You know, it depends on the kinds of structures you want to build. You know, maybe you start off small as well. You know, we were, we were always thinking we could make a little shelter for the for the rover. You, have you seen that one? Like a little a little rover that Australia's uh, working Yeah, on, yeah, I sure have. Like yeah, that. Mm -hmm. yeah uh, building like little domes for sure. Uh, rovers on the That's a great idea. Well, fascinating. Obviously, then there's more work and, and presumably more funding required oh, yeah. to get this thing going. But at the same time, the idea is ISRU, and I'm a big advocate of that. So thank you very much for your time. No, no worries. All right. Folks, for the third time, we have an opportunity to learn more about Star Lab. The first time was with NanoRex. The second time was with Airbus. The third time with you folks. Would you be so kind, Marshall, as to introduce yourself to the viewers? Yeah, and my name's Marshall Smith. I'm the CEO of Star Lab. So I understand you don't have a lot of time to give us, and I quite understand that. We're looking at a bit of a layout of the station now. Can you just give us some a quick overview of what's going to be going into orbit. This is a single launch station, is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. So Star Lab, you know, one of the things we learned from the ISS is building in space is hard, really hard. Building and integrating and testing in space. So the better option is to, to get our costs down, which of course this is a commercial uh, endeavor and we want to get our costs as low as possible, is to build as much on the ground, test and integrate it on the ground and make sure that it works. So our goal is to take advantage of launch vehicles that aren't haven't been around uh, before, like Starship and other vehicles that, that might be out there with really large capability. You know, ISS was built so that it could fit in the back of the space shuttle. Uh, that's not a constraint in this world. So what can we what can we launch on and how can we maximize that space? So if you look around you at this uh, enclosure, this is actually a one-to-one -one scale of the Star, Star Lab uh, interior. Wow. So it, it's huge. Um, and then with that, we're able to, we're about 40% of the volume of the ISS, uh, pressurized volume, and we have uh, a tremendous number of, of uh, capability for the payload. So what we look at is what you're seeing here in this area is one floor of three floors of habitation. And then we have, we actually have seven total floors where storage and other systems, electrical systems, so three habitation floors. And, and what you'll see is, uh, quite a large amount of, of lab capability as we move forward and research capability. Um, and, and, you know, right now we're 50% subscribed. So, you know, if you look at people say, is there a market? There's absolutely a market. We, we're already 50% subscribed and we, you know, that we think that will jump tremendously as the programs uh, continue. So let's compare this to Orbital Reef and other stations like it. Obviously, this can be done in one launch. Orbital Reach probably takes more than that. Is this modular as well? Can you make it bigger? We can make it bigger. Uh, but, you know, the kind of question is, again, why repeat what we did in the past? You know, did different customers have different needs. This is a science and research station, scientific research station. So, you know, let's focus something like this on the needs of the scientific research community. Maybe another station might be more manufacturing based. Do I want to put manufacturing next to somebody who's trying to keep a really precise microgravity environment for research? Probably not, uh, especially when you talk about tourism and other things like that that other people may be into. Um, you know, there might be a need to maybe replicate this in multiple instantiations. So maybe we have Star Lab 2, Star Lab 3, Star Lab 4, and they have a different focus in semiconductors, biopharma, manufacturing, things like that. So in terms of launch vehicle and launch provider requirements, I mean, we know how huge this module is. Does it essentially require Starship? If Starship, I mean, Starship will almost certainly succeed. Let's say it doesn't. Could you fit a smaller version into New Glenn, something along those lines? We're, we're very confident that uh, Starship will succeed, but there are other options available. Fantastic. Anything else you'd like to share with the viewers about Star Lab and what sets it apart? Yeah, I think, I think we've hit the major, major points on this with respect to the payload capability. We're going to be permanently crewed for the first time. You know, when you talk about uh, going up and doing demonstration missions, you know, 30-day missions, that's back to what we did in shuttle. We've built an entire economy already around this capability. And, and if we were to push this off for years, which is what could happen if we went to a demo approach, uh, you would see that economy that commercial market economy have, have some serious issues. So we want to continue that. We've got, a, we've got you know, Voyager through Nanorex uh, originally has been, we're the largest uh, 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 
provider, if you will, of services on the ISS. We've put up literally thousands of missions uh, as we move forward, thousands of experiments, hundreds of satellites been been deployed. Um, and we're taking that, we look at, okay, we want to own the platform, we want to actually operate the platform, and then we can bring that pipeline that we already have to bear as we uh, go and, and use it in, in space. Well, Marshall, I know you're a busy man. I'll let you get to what you need to do here at the conference. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Jordan. Really appreciate that. And, and thanks to your viewers. So once again, a brief slice, a very brief slice of what I got to see at IAC from a very promising at European launch provider to a pretty incredible robot designed for in-situ manufacturing, of course, Star Lab, which in my opinion is the most promising replacement for the International Space Station. Between this station and VAST, I would say that these two solutions are the closest to providing a practical replacement for the ISS, although I have to say, Star Lab and a single launch solution can put up a lot more habitable space than VAST can in the short run anyway. So looking forward to seeing what these companies bring to us next, and I've got a lot more IAC to come. So stay tuned. Thanks again for watching. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, and until next time, stay angry about space.